thanks everyone for being here for our session today with Kin. As I mentioned, the purpose of this session is more the Q&A because it's actually what really bring in there. So Kin will, um, will take us through his passion of build and quality and what the work that he's been doing for a while. So Ken, the platform is yours. Okay, so I'm gonna be doing the video, it's about half an hour, but I'm also gonna be doing on chat. So if there's a question that comes up during the video, just throw it in the chat. So you get both of me, you get the, the voice of me and you get um, uh, me on, on chat as well. So let's see if this all works just like it's supposed to. Okay, and let me open up uh, chat and put it in the right place so it doesn't overlap. Okay, and then I'm gonna mute. Welcome to Shift Testing Left to Build In Quality. Hello, I'm Ken Pugh. First, let's start off where, what are the tests for this session? Well, they're also known as objectives. You should go into a session and have tests and see whether those tests pass by the end of the session. So let's look at some objectives. Describe how Shift Left testing helps builds in quality. Identify how loopbacks are reduced by Shift Left testing. Identify the different aspects of shift left testing and describe the collaboration in shift left testing. Do you have any tests? If so, put them in the chat box and we'll see whether we've met them by the end of this session. So hello again, I'm Ken Pugh. I'm the chief consultant at Ken Pugh Inc. I'm the author of seven books, including Lean Agile <laughs> Acceptance Test Driven Development better software through collaboration, as well as pre-factoring, extreme abstraction, extreme separation, and extreme readability. And I'm the co-creator of the Safe Agile Software Engineering. Here's my overall rule. There are exceptions to every statement except this one. And what do I mean by that? If I say you always ought to do something, I don't mean always, always, but usually always. And when I say you never ought to do something, I don't mean never ever, but usually never. So if you find something in this session, you go, that won't work here, feel free to raise your hand with the exception, because we learn by the exceptions as well as by the rules. Here's my second overall rule. Context is everything. Everything exists in a context. And Everything is always true in some context. You've probably read of Netflix doing 15,000 deployments a day. But as a user of Netflix, what's the worst thing that can happen? Ah, your video doesn't show up, so you just reload it again. You're saying, oh, it must be my internet provider. But if you're doing stock market transactions and you get one of those wrong, well, you've got an unhappy customer and a Securities and Exchange Commission to answer to. And finally, perspective. If we only look at one thing, one way, we get a distorted view of the underlying truth. So it's best to have a second and a third perspective. And now we get three views on the same underlying truth. And we have better knowledge and better understanding. So that's the power of three. So first, a brief introduction. What is built-in quality? Well, it's building the right thing and building that thing right. Two sides to it. So why do we want to invest in shifting left? Well, here's a curve of the relative effort in solving an issue at particular stages in the deployment cycle. If we find an issue at requirements time, while we're gathering the requirements, we're gonna call that a one. If we don't find out about 
at issue until coding time, it's a 4 because now we have to have another meeting, redo a little bit of code. We don't find out about it until testing, that's a 16 because now we have to put a defect, triage it, have a meeting on it and everything. And finally, if we don't discover it until production, that could be a 64. Now, some places have actually done some measurements. And it doesn't matter really whether you're water for or agile. This was an agile place. And they realized that still it was like 250 times the effort of fixing an issue in production rather than fixing it at requirement time. Now, could be something else. So let's see what happens here. And typically, we write a feature, then we write a story, then we write some code. And this is the old style, if you will. And then you realize, well, I've got some code. I better write a test for that code. And then you realize, well, the story is done. I'd better figure out how to test the story. And finally, it's like, well, we've got a feature done. Let's figure out how to test the feature. And this is what we call the old-fashioned traditional testing V model. Okay. We write stuff and then we figure out how to test it. And what happens with our flow in this model? Well, we decide we're going to do something. We analyze that requirement, be it as either a simple story or something larger. We do a little design, some code, some test, deploy it, and finally execute it in production. And we get a flow. And that flows our business value from decision out to execution, if it was only that simple. So what happens is we get loopbacks. We get loopbacks from test to code as those defects pile up in our JIRA board. Oh, and that breaks our flow. And then we get looped back from test to analyze because we realize that we didn't really understand the requirement. And finally, there are some loop backs from execute back to analyze as well. And every one of these breaks the flow, the delivery of business value. Now, in test first, what are we all doing? We're always thinking about testing. We write a feature. We create the test for that feature. We write a story. We create a test for that story. We write the code, and we create a test for that code. And we're shifting that testing left. And in fact, as we'll see, we write the test before we write the code. We write the story test as we write the story, and same for the feature. So we're shifting our testing left. Now, is it shift testing left or shift left testing? Well, it really doesn't matter. You can't test something until you have that something, obviously. So what are we talking about? It's really about creating the test on the left, not executing it. Creating when we're coming up with our requirements. And here's our overall phrase. No code goes in until the test goes on. We're not going to start an implementation until we have a test that tells us that that implementation matches the, the requirements. So let's take a look at the flow here. Decide, analyze, test code, and so forth. We have three different processes that are going on. The first is hypothesis-driven development. And that's what the product manager and the owner get together and do. And the cycle for it is at the time you're going to decide to do something, you create a hypothesis, a test for it. And we'll be doing the testing in production. And we'll see that in a little more detail. Next, we have behavior-driven development. And that's the triad, the product owner, customer, business analyst, the developers, and the testers. And that goes on between the analysis of the requirement and late as staging. And then we have 
TDD, or test-driven development, or test-driven design. And that's the developer, or a pair of developers, or a developer and tester. And that's much tighter in the design encoding phase. Very quick cycle time. So those are three things we're going to talk about. HDDD, BDD, and TDD. Now the key is we want to write testable features, story, and code. So at the top level, we're going to have some feature tests that we'll create with hypothesis-driven development. At the next level, the story test will create with behavior-driven development. And our code test will create with test-driven development and design. So at the time we are creating our feature stories and code, we are writing these tests. There's another way of looking at how these things interrelate. We have our as-is system. And our as-is system has some story tests from the outside and code tests for the inside components. And then in addition, we might have some enabler tests, the architectural tests that go against our infrastructure, our, our architecture. So that's where we would be as an as-is system. Now we come up with an idea for a new feature, and that's going to be our to-be system. And we'll have some feature tests, the hypothesis-driven development, and we'll look at that shortly. And then again, we'll have some story tests for the feature itself or the individual pieces and some code tests for the implementation. And of course, these will be our new and we'll also should still be able to pass all the old story and code tests as well. So it turns out that tests and requirements are related. Every requirement should have a test. Every test is a requirement. And if you cannot deploy with a failing test, then that test is a requirement the system must meet. Requirements have tests. Every test is a requirement. And obviously, we want our requirements before implementation. That is the number one thing that people say. Well, if we need requirements before implementation, then, tests and requirements are completely interrelated. Now, there's a little ditty that goes something like this. Tests and requirements, tests and requirements, go together like a horse and carriage. How they go together, you can't have one without the other. This is why I'm still in software. So let's look at the top. Here's hypothesis-driven development. In hypothesis-driven development, we have an idea for a functional change, a new feature. And we're going to create an hypothesis as to whether the customer is actually going to use that functionality. And that is a test of whether we're building the right thing. If the customer doesn't use it, we're building the wrong thing. So this is from Lean Startup, Lean UX, and some other places. We start with what we call a minimum marketable feature. And that's the smallest piece of functionality with intrinsic business or market value. And we want small marketable features so we release our functionality sooner, get it out of production, and get our learning back from the users. So we need a benefit hypothesis for this MMF. Hey, we have the hypothesis. We build an MMF, the smallest piece of functionality. And then we run our test. Here is the creation of the test. Here is the execution of the test. And we evaluate whether that feature was actually utilized by customers. Maybe it isn't, in which case we just stop work on that feature. Maybe said, yep, it looks good. Let's go on to our next MMF. Or perhaps we go, I'm not sure that we got it quite right. So let's do a pivot. Let's change the MMF slightly and send it out again and see if we get a better result. 
So that what we're doing is to learn what users truly desire based on their behavior. So let's give an idea here. A cruise control with speed automatically set by the speed limit. And we're going to find that speed limit either with a GPS and a map that has the speed limits, or maybe a sign reader, or maybe both. A couple of ways we could do this. Now it turns out autonomous vehicles are going to require this. Because if an autonomous vehicle keeps speeding, then Elon Musk is going to have a lot of speeding tickets to pay. So, there's our idea. And let's give a little more detail here. Given a speed limit sign, when the car views it, then the speed is set to 35 miles per hour. There we go. That's the idea. And now what we need, a benefit hypothesis with some metrics. And the template for this is, we think that a capability will produce an outcome as measured by a metric. And here's the example. We think that cruise control with speed limit finder will be used by drivers 90% of the time as measured by telemetry. And we're going to keep track of how often the cruise control button is pushed. There we have a test and a way to measure that test, which Obviously, we can't do until it's actually in the car and under use. So what do you think the results will be? How many people do you think will actually utilize this? Enter into your chat box what you think. Now, here is where context is important. Perhaps we're in a, in a country where they've got speed limit cameras all over the place. <clears throat> It costs a lot of money if you exceed the speed limit. Chances are drivers might be using this 90, 95% of the time, if not 100% of the time. But maybe if you're in, you're in a lax place, like maybe Boston, well, maybe they won't use it. So we'd have to do a pivot. Maybe we're going to pivot and say, we're going to also allow you to set the speed limit by some amount over. And now the driver is doing this, so if the car speeds, Elon Musk won't have to pay the ticket. So what should we have as a limit of how much you can set it over? Five, 10, 15, 20 miles per hour. Well, maybe you might stop there. And then if it turns out you go to a place like Boston, Massachusetts, where I lived for a while, 20 miles per hour, it would be the minimum that you'd want to be able to set it over the speed limit, or else you get tailgated by all the other cars. So maybe you do a slightly different pivot. Maybe we just display the speed limit and make the driver feel guilty. Or display a warning if over the speed limit. So we take an hypothesis. We see what the results are. We either decide to drop it move on to the next one, or pivot and change our MMF accordingly. So that's hypothesis-driven development. Let's take behavior-driven development. Tests are created for the functionality prior to its implementation to ensure we're building the thing right. And it's done by the triad. The developer, tester, and customer. Customer is the product owner, the business analyst, the SME, anyone who knows what the requirements are. And the triad combined are responsible for the quality of the product. And we're now again thinking test first. And the other reason why we do want to do this is it's easier to automate tests written before an implementation then afterwards, if you don't think about testing until the application is all done, the only way you typically can automate is through the user interface. And that's often slow and fragile. So in addition to just understanding, we also, thinking test first will help us with automation. So let's look at 
how these things happen. We have a behavior for a scenario. That is, we have some setup or given of a current state, and we have a trigger, which is often the when, some action or event that occurs, and then we assert that this is what we expect the result should be. That's a scenario of behavior. Well, what's a test for this scenario? Well, we need to set up that current state, we need to trigger the action or event, and then check that the actual results match our expected results. If they do, our implementation passes. If not, well, we still have work to do. So it turns out that BDD and ATDD are pretty well related. Behavior-driven development focuses on the behavior, that scenario. Given the car's speed is 30 miles per hour, when the speed limit changes to 20 miles per hour, then the car's speed becomes 20 miles per hour. Pretty straightforward. And we're going to have a test that by behavior. Here's our test. Given the car's speed is 30, speed limit changes to 20, we check the car's speed becomes 20 miles per hour. Behavior, test of the behavior. Well, it turns out acceptance test-driven development simply focuses that we are going to test that behavior. Behavior-driven development starts with the behavior, which gets turned into a test. So BDD and ATDD are actually just two slightly different viewpoints on the same underlying process. But the other reason we want to do these scenarios is what else might we want to test when we change to 20 miles per hour? Maybe how quickly it slows down or whether it jams on the brake when we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Or maybe we want to make sure it does as a behavior. So we have a lot of other behaviors that we can specify ahead of time that then the implementers can make sure that the implementation passes. If you don't specify it, it's hard to write an implementation for a requirement that doesn't exist. So let's give a business rule scenario. Here is a school zone. Between the hour and these hours, that is what the speed limit should be. And we want to write some tests for this. Well, our speed limit varies in school zones, and so we're going to come up with some tests. Here's our business rule data, 745 to 845, it should be 35 miles per hour. And here are some tests for that business rule. At 744, it should be 45 miles per hour, because that's the speed limit for the road. And at 745, it should be 35 miles per hour, because that's when the school zone applies. Now, once again, once we come up with these tests, we can start to ask a few more details. Is it exactly 744? What about 74401? Can I still be at 45 miles an hour? And so forth. And once again, how quickly do I need to slow down? And exactly where does that 45 or 35 mile per hour begin? Does it begin at the speed zone, at the speed limit sign, or somewhere else? So that's our business rule test. So the third part is test-driven development, or I also like to call it test-driven design. And we're, once again, thinking test first. We do not test code. We code to the test, an entirely different mindset shift. So in test-driven design, our design allocates responsibilities for passing those external tests, the ones we got from behavior-driven development, to internal entities, our components, our classes, and so forth. That's test-driven design. So we also have a test-driven development cycle, which consists of writing the test first, checking that the test fails to make sure that the test is actually testing something, writing the code to pass the test, checking that all the other tests still pass, 
Now looking at our code and refactoring it if necessary to make it a little cleaner. And finally checking the, all the other test paths. Well now that BDD, we can't really test it until we have the tire implementation. But TDD, this cycle could be on the order of seconds or minutes, depending on how fast you write the test and how fast you write the code. It's a very quick cycle. Okay. So let's give an example of TDD. With BDD, we came up with our business rule and our test for that business rule for the, the school zone. So now we're going to take just one of those tests and we'll code it up. 744 at 45 miles per hour, because that's the speed limit for the road. Well, we'll make sure that our component returns that. And then we'll take the next test, 745 at 35 miles per hour. And the next test, 845 at 35, and so forth, 846 at 45. And we'll code one test, we'll write the code to pass it, make sure everything else passes it, and continually add and add more tests. And that's test-driven development, one little test at a time. Let's do another example of test-driven development, the speed sign processing. Well, we could start by just seeing if we can identify the speed limit on a sign that's head-on with very clean text. If we can do that, we might move on to the next scenario with a sign that's side-on. You're looking at it this way with clean text. Maybe a sign head-on with fuzzy text. Maybe a sign head-on with missing letters or holes in the sign or whatever. And we continually change our implementation to pass the additional scenarios and the tests for those scenarios. So this is not an ending, but a beginning. What have we shown here? Well, we've got our code test for the inside and our story test for the external test for the outside that we developed with BDD and TDD. And those feature tests, the hypothesis-driven development, are our customers using that actual feature? And then we have our story test and our code test for that new feature. Now what happens with our flow when we do this? Well, at our decision point, we are going to decide with tests. We are going to create that hypothesis that we are going to check in production. When we analyze our requirements, we're going to analyze those with tests to make sure that we have a clear understanding. When we design, we're going to design with tests to make our code testable. And if obviously when we code, we're going to code with tests. Oh, this next little section here, are we still going to have to do some tests? Yeah, but they're going to be greatly reduced because most of the functionality issues we've dealt with before. Maybe it's an environmental issue or some performance issue or something that is not testable on the developer's machine. Now, we're going to deploy and we'll deploy with some of those BDD tests. And finally, we'll execute. And if possible, we'll execute with some production tests. That all depends on what your context is. So now, by adding all these tests, we're getting rid or dramatically decreasing that loop back from test back to code. And we're decreasing dramatically, in fact, in some places, actually getting rid of entirely that loop back from test to analyze. And often that loop back from production to back goes away as well. And what does this do for us? It dramatically increases our flow. Now, just a recap here. We described how shift left testing helps us build in quality. We identified how loopbacks are reduced by shift left testing. We identified some dis aspects of shift left testing. And we described the collaboration in shift left testing. So we can also take a look at the chat and see if we've answered any of your tests. Did it pass your test? 
And I'd just like to make one note how to experience behavior-driven development, acceptance test-driven development, and test-driven development. I've got an online course for corporations and companies because we want to deal with the collaboration of the triad. And that's a lean, agile, acceptance test-driven, behavior-driven development, better software through collaboration. And that involves the triad, the product owner, the developers, and the testers. And during this workshop, we use the team's real stories for the exercises. And we have two half days for all the teams and a half day for each team so we can delve into the issues that are particular to that team's context. And we have behavior-focused test-driven development and design. And that's five half days, breakout sessions for the pairs, and that's a, either two developers or a developer and a tester. If you want more information, contact me on LinkedIn at Ken Pugh. Email me, ken at kenpugh.com. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Ken. So we have a couple of questions and interesting answer already. So um, do, do we want to collaborate about that more, Samuel and Ken? Uh, adjust my question. It's about automation, because if we do the automation, it will be fast. This process, this is one thing. And second thing, uh, sometimes about automation, it will be more costing about the timing or resources or skills you need to develop in your team. So this is my question. And which type of testing also? Because uh, as the answer coming in here, it's about business rule. Not all the testing can be automated. Ken? So, okay. <laughs> Some of that are left over from the video playing. Okay, so at the, um, so there's three levels of testing. And so at the top, we're going to have an end to end test that goes from all the way from, uh, let's say you're doing an insurance thing, all the way that might go from entering a claim to the final payout, okay? So a real long one of those. That's typically hard to automate, all right? But we at least need one of those to make sure that everything is plumbed all together. Now, let's just take a little part of that. This is, in fact, I was just doing this course. Uh, I was just doing a BDD course for some people in Guelph today. So, like, all of these, uh, all of these examples are fresh in my cash, if you will. So, let's just take uh, a part of the flow of actually entering the claim. All right, and making sure that all the things are valid. That's easier to automate. And it does have some benefits in the automation. And now we, there are two different ways that we can automate. Unfortunately, with Guidewire, if you're using something like that, it's, it's not quite as easy because you've already got a predetermined framework. But if we were doing custom software uh, for something like that, making sure that a form, a single page or web page gives out the right data, that's relatively easy to automate. But if we could talk to the actual underlying components, instead of having to write automation through the GUI, which is what I always push is, write your automation beneath the UI, then that's a lot faster to automate and gives us our necessary confidence that underneath our functionality is working. And then down at the third level, we have business rules and especially in insurance firms tons of business rules i've seen hundreds of business rules given these conditions and this condition should we how much money should our premium be 
And so those business rules, in fact, are the simplest to automate. In fact, they're much easy. They're easy to automate and they often provide the quickest payback for issues. And the other interesting thing about business rules is that, well, the business person knows what the business rule is all about. And as it turns out, you start to describe the business rule and we come up with a table of values. Here's some inputs and outputs that that is actually clarifying how the business rule works in their mind. And so I consider about 50% of code in this world is probably about business rules. And those are the hardest sometimes to actually get right. Um, and so if we can automate those tests against the business rules, they're not, they're simple to automate. In fact, the cost of automation is practically zero compared with the amount of time it takes to actually create what that, how that business rule should work. And so, and those are often the ones that are, that are often one gets wrong. Oh, we didn't know about this edge case or, and so forth and so on. So yes, we want an end to end. Yes, we want tests on individual pieces, but which are sim simpler to automate, but in distinct form, in great form, we want all the tests for those business rules. And that has, has a much more immediate payback. Okay, thank you. So, actually, I have a question for Ken. Um, firstly, thank you for a wonderful presentation. The concept was really clear, um, but my question lies on actual implementation. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, understand it in the flow of scaled agile, meaning how does HD, um, I mean, hypothesis de driven development testing and BDD gets tested uh, because most of the stories and features, they come uh, prior to PI planning. We groom them earlier. So do you mean to say that we need to test them during the grooming phase and be assured that these uh, hypotheses and these uh, stories or features are tested and we are ready to implement them and then bring test-driven development or do the practice of test-driven driven development during the sprints. So I just wanted to like get a, a picture of that. Okay. Yep, that's, that, that is an interesting question. So, because often your stories are often created just in PI planning, exactly. that the product owner comes, brings a feature and then the stories get broken up. And even if there was a little preparation before the, the PI planning, well, the stories just get your, give, uh, you know, as a, um, as a user, I want this and that. Mm -hmm. And you really don't have time to create all these tests. So what, as far as the timing thing goes, and it's, and it's a little off in the very first sprint, so normally I say, hey, um, we got to do a catch up this for if we if we've just finished PI planning and the next day we start the sprint, it's like, OK, we need a catch up this first day of the sprint. All right. And but for the rest of the sprints on a typical sprint schedule, what I always suggest is if we are in sprint uh, three, we have the triad gets together and develops some outlines of tests, i.e. some general given when then scenarios, not with all the data. And then if, then if you can't determine even some, some general outline, then you don't try and schedule that on the next sprint because you know, we don't have, we, it doesn't look like we have any sufficient information. You triad gets together, does that, you present it into your story grooming session. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no way you're gonna create an outline during your story grooming session. There's just not enough time. So you, 
spend a half an hour on a story with the triad and you create some outlines. Present it to the team during your story grooming session. Mm -hmm. Now, because you've got some, some outlines of test, an estimate for that story can be better made. If you don't have any tests, estimating stories is just um, a guesstimate. And then when you pull the, the story off the backlog in, um, uh, in, in the next iteration, that's when you then add in all the tests and uh, pull it off. So you're not doing the test and prior to PI planning, you're not creating the outlines prior to PI planning, you're doing them just in time. Which then it may turn out that you realize, oh, we thought this was a three point story, it's a 13 point story. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's agility. You re reschedule things. Okay, so just a quick follow-up question on that then. Um, so. Exactly. As you mentioned, we are testing during the sprint, all SDD, BDD, and TDDs. And then should it be a separate story kind of thing or what, what, how are the tests actually should be planned? What is the better way? Should it be like separate uh, story or should it could be part of story? Or what, what is the best practice? Over Always there? part of the story. It's the definition of done of a story is passing all the BDD test that you come up with. Okay, perfect. That's it. That you do that not have a testing first. story. Okay. That's, that's minus agile. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So Ken, one question around um, scaling testing up. So does the same apply on testing the feature, testing the epic from that perspective? Well, okay, if you're testing a feature, that's gonna be much bigger. And all we're gonna do is just do a thin test, a smoke test almost against the feature to make sure that the flow of the feature works. On an epic, even a thinner, one little smoke test all the way through the, the, the workflow to make sure it works. And I always suggest that if you're writing the feature, well, maybe the architect, the RTE, and the product manager create that thin test through the feature. If they can't come up with a test for the feature, they shouldn't be putting the feature into the PI. That makes sense, yes. I mean, they're not getting down into the giddy, nitty gritty details, but if they can't come up with, here's how something should work from a, a high level point of view, it's not PI planable. Um, one of my favorite topic is actually about the solution and how things as emerge, they transform from um, variable to fixed kind of that, how that relate to the testing that we are doing or how that could be planned as part of the testing that we are doing, basing that on knowledge, basing that on um, evaluation of the, of the, of, uh, the option that we are eliminating. Well, okay, so we had the little discussion in the solution context prior to this. Um, remember that these tests as you create them are going to actually be added to the context. They, they form the automated test and all the way down form that context for the next solution. So they're going to be transforming from a variable part into a fixed part of that, that context. Um, that's at least how I would, I would see the connection between the two. Because basically once I have all the set of tests that the system pass, that truly is the context for adding another feature.
Thank you. So if there's no more questions, um, we'll be happy to close early. I would like to thank you, Ken, for being here. And I, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you. Great discussion. Thanks everyone who attend. Thanks everyone who will be watching. All right. Take care. We'll see ya. Bye.